Sahar, <clears throat> shall I record on my computer or in a cloud on my computer, right? Yeah, I think it's on your computer. Sure. <clears throat> so now it's six. Yes. So, okay. uh, yes, good uh, evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, today's CBD event. Um, so, let me share. Um, okay. Sahar, can you make me the presenter so I can uh, share my uh, screen? So today is um, part five of uh, six series for diabetes, uh, rev uh, diabetes review and management. Um, uh, Dr. Mona, can you make me the host, please? Sure. You are the host now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Sorry for that, I'm having a issue with sharing. Yes, okay. So again, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you again for uh, joining uh, our CBD today. So uh, as I told you, to, um, today's session is uh, part five of our uh, di diabetes care and management series. So I, ha I hope you had the chance to attend the previous uh, parts. So today is, um, part five, which is diabetes self-management. So thank you so, so much for joining uh, our uh, session today. So just to uh, remind you that uh, to, to be able to claim your CBD points, um, um, you are highly appreciated to uh, fill in the CBD evaluation, which will be available after the uh, CBD event up to seven days of the day of the day of the event. And you will receive your certificates and your points within seven days of completing your evaluation. And just to let you know that your feedback and views will be taken into consideration for our uh, uh, future CBD uh, uh, pro, um, um, events and for further uh, development. Uh, so also to remind you that um, uh, we have uh, the last part of uh, the this series, uh, part X, which is diabetes complications. It will be, inshallah, next week on Tuesday, April 6th. So you are highly um, advised to uh, register in this event uh, um, uh, and also to provide your uh, feedback. So to remind you as well, we have uh, we usually issue um, CBD newsletter every uh, beginning of uh, each month. So the CBD newsletter um, provide um, summary of our ongoing CBD events and on uh, and provide future uh, summary of our uh, future CBD events and also provide um, uh, we we add like your feedback on our uh, CBD events. So if you are interested to receive this uh, letter, newsletter, we usually actually we share it with our participants. But if you are currently not receiving the newsletter, you can just email us uh, so we can add you to our uh, list. And also, I would like to welcome um, uh, um, the participants who joined the YouTube. So welcome uh, all of you. Um, okay, so um, for today's session, we have uh, uh, Dr. Dina Hassan, uh, who is Assistant Professor in Public Health. She will speaking about the patient-centered care approach and principles of diabetes management. And we have Dr. Ghadir al who, uh, who's Assistant Professor in Health Education and Promotion in Qatar University. So she will uh, be talking about behavioral change theories and patient empowerment principles in diabetes self-management. 
And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Manal, the Director of Diabetes Education at Hamad Medical Corporation. She will describe the available structured diabetes self-management programs in Qatar, and she will follow that with case study and discussion. And we will be monitoring um, your comments in the chat box, either in uh, WebEx or in YouTube. So you are highly encouraged to ask your questions or add your experience or comments, and I can also discuss that with our speakers during uh, our event. <clears throat> okay, so without further ado, I will start with um, Dr. Diana. So, Dr. Diana, I will make you the presenter. So you can share your uh, slides. Great. So you are the presenter now. Okay, is it uploaded? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining our CPD series part five, which is a patient centered care approaches in diabetes self management. Um, I have no relationships or conflict of interests to disclose. So, like Dr. Muna. Um, described earlier, these are the learning objectives of this session. And I would like to start uh, by asking you a question. How do you define a patient? So uh, please type your answers in the chat box and we'll take maybe 30 seconds to answer this question. So how do you define a patient? So you can type your answer in the chat box. Do you have any answers, Mona? Um, so um, patient could be defined as someone who can uh, who, who suffers or someone who needs help. Um, an individual who needs support. Okay. Yeah. So these. Very good. Uh, yeah. Anyone That's, else? Do you, you have get a gold uh, star if you participate? A brown. Yeah. These, are, yeah, these are the comments. Any anyone else from anyone the else? Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't have further comments. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so it's basically, Yanni, if we look at the traditional definition of a patient, it's a person who is receiving medical, surgical, or other forms of treatment for a disorder or an illness. And um, actually, the earliest definitions of a patient is someone who suffers. So, as you can see, um, these definitions are um, in line with your answers, and uh, that's basically the first thing that comes to mind when we hear when we hear the word patient. Uh, so, as you can see, these definitions actually they imply uh, that the patient is or the person vulnerable and uh, dependent. So, it implies vulnerability and dependence, and of course, the definitions they actually. Means uh, to the limitations of the traditional biomedical model, again, in which vulnerability and dependence are characteristics of a patient. So, um, because of these limitations, actually, the development of patient-centered um, approach or care approach, you know, was a response to the earlier perceived limitations of the traditional biomedical uh, model. So let's take a look at some important milestones uh, when it comes to uh, the patient-centered approach. So in 1969, uh, the patient-centered approach, uh, or basically the concept of it was first launched by uh, Michael and uh, Belind, 
when they basically described it as another way of medical thinking. And that was when they held seminars on psychological uh, problems in their general practices. And then in, 19, in 1977, the World Health Organization advocated that patients uh, should participate in their health care. And then further, uh, the Vienna recommendations on um, health promoting hospitals, uh, they basically recognized the necessity that the patient should be um, active and should have a participatory role uh, to improve both the quality and the efficiency of um, healthcare. So today, actually, the literature uh, that advocates patient and or person-centered healthcare um, is really widespread. And despite the concepts being very significant in healthcare and research showing that, you know, they, these, these concepts are significant uh, when it comes to patient outcomes, uh, there isn't really a consensus on uh, the definition of these um, concepts. So some definitions um, or some explanations to, to this approach is basically the Institute of Medicine uh, or the IOM for short in 2001 uh, defined or basically described a uh, patient-centered approach as healthcare that establishes a partnership among practitioners, patients, and their families, of course, when appropriate, to ensure that decisions respect patients' wants and needs and preferences, and that patients have the education and the support they require or they need to make decisions and participate in their own care. And another uh, definition is, uh, it's, you know, a simpler or shorter definition is uh, providing care that is respectful uh, of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all the clinical decisions. So, as you can tell from these two definitions, it's really about it's it's really it's about a mindset and a, a philosophy. It's not really just about providing services or activities to uh, to patients. So, in a way, it requires um, a shift in in our mindsets as healthcare providers and as patients, of course. So, um, there has been a lot of work done on patient centeredness. Um, but one of the famous uh, studies is actually by Pickers Institute and Harvard. And um, what they did was they conducted focus group with patients and they came up with eight uh, principles of patient centered care. And these are on the slide for you. So let's go through each one of them. So the first one is respect for patients preferences. So let me ask you this, how do you practice this principle in your, um, when, you, when you deal with patients? How do you respect patients' values, preferences, and expressed needs? So again, feel free to type your answers in the chat box, and then we'll um, take a look to the list. Dr. Diana, can you repeat your question? Because I think your voice was not clear. Oh. So, um, basically, the first principle of patient centeredness is respect needs. So, my question uh, for the participants is how do you practice this principle? I'm getting a message that there is difficulty with the network, but I'm not sure if it's from my side or your side, Dr. Yeah, I think you, your voice like uh, uh, disconnected for a few seconds. So basically you are covering the first. Um, uh, the first principle, yeah. Eight principle of patient care, which is respect patient uh, preference, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, any so, answer? So I'm unable, I'm um, unable yes. to see the chat box. Yeah. So respect patient needs. Mm -hmm. 
respect I consider his uh, preferences. Absolutely. Consider culture. Yeah, and we'll come back to the culture. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think also uh, consider his beliefs. Um, okay. Yeah, Expl explain the procedures. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good answer. So absolutely. So involve the patients in decision making, um, and of course recognize that individuals with their own values, their own beliefs, their own preferences. Uh, treat them with dignity and and sensitivity again to their cultural uh, values and autonomy. So is coordination and integration of care. So um, remember I told you that this study did uh, focus groups with patients. So basically patients reported that they often feel uh, vulnerable and powerlessness or powerless when it comes to um, coordination and integration of care. So what do you think we should do to basically alleviate these feelings of vulnerability and powerlessness? So any idea? So, uh, uh, involving the patients in the process. Yeah. Uh, I th yeah, I think this is also reflects the autonomy uh, of the patient. Okay. okay. And of course, it involves coordination of clinical care and ancillary and support to the coordination of frontline patient care as well. So the third principle is about information and education. So um, again, patients uh, described or basically voiced that uh, they are not being completely informed about their prognosis. Okay, this is a very common practice in, in certain cultures. What do you think we should do about this, this point? How can we involve patients or how can we, like, how do you feel or how, what would you do to inform or to keep patients informed um, about their prognosis? Um, okay. Um, patients, uh, are like meeting with patients, uh, special meeting with patients, um, family also, caregivers. Yeah, so information definitely provide the, the patients with information or clinical status, their progress, their prognosis, be transparent, um, provide information on the process of care, and of course, information to facilitate autonomy, self-care, and health promotion. And we'll talk more about, you know, empowering uh, patients, uh, you know, throughout this process. So the fourth principle is really about physical comfort. And uh, patients in this study basically reported that uh, their physical comfort or their physical health has a significant impact on their experience. So these three areas were reported as particularly very important to patients, which is pain management, assistance with activity and daily uh, living needs, in addition to the hospital surroundings and the environment. And uh, the fifth area or the fifth uh, principle of um, patient centeredness is emotional support and alleviation of fear and anxiety. So again, uh, fear and anxiety can be associated with, uh, that are associated with illness can be uh, very debilitating just as the physical effect of the illness. So again, um, uh, these three areas were reported as very, you know, important to the patients, um, which is anxiety over physical status, treatment and prognosis, anxiety over the impact of the illness um, on themselves and on their families, 
in addition to anxiety over the financial impact of the illness on themselves and on their families as well. And the sixth um, principle is involvement of family and friends. So again, um, the level, uh, so, so basically, you know, how do we involve family and friends in the patient's experience? Um, again, it's very important to provide accommodations to the family and, and to friends, involving them in the decision making, uh, supporting them as caregivers. We often uh, forget about uh, the burden that sometimes chronic condition, uh, and since we're talking about diabetes, um, so basically how diabetes places a burden on uh, the caregivers uh, often, you know, a lot of um, adult children become caregivers to their to their uh, elderly parents. So in involving and caring for these family members as caregivers is very important as well. And supporting them and, of course, recognizing the needs of um, family and um, friends. Then the seventh uh, principle is um, continuity and transition. So again, uh, the patient's concerns about their ability to care for themselves after discharge is also a very important pillar. And uh, we could do this by uh, providing them with understandable, detailed information regarding the medication. Uh, you know, when they're discharged, the, the physical limitations, again, being very transparent with them, any dietary needs, any other needs that they, uh, that they might, um, need or face, uh, coordinate and plan on going treatment and services after the discharge, and of course, provide information regarding access to clinical, um, social and financial support uh, on a continuing basis. So once the patient is dis discharged, you really have to maintain that continuity of care uh, to ensure that their needs are met after they are discharged. Uh, remember, because, you know, diabetes is a chronic condition. And then finally, uh, the eighth pillar or uh, principle is access to care. So patients need to know that they can access uh, care whenever is needed. Um, and uh, focusing mainly on ambulatory care, it's important that we take into consideration the access um, of the to the location of hospitals, clinics, and physicians' offices, uh, the ability of patients to get to the hospital on time, uh, making scheduling appointments easy. Again, all of these were patients' concerns that came out from these uh, focus groups, and of course, uh, not just uh, you know making the appointments easy, but making them available when the patient needs them. And of course, access to any other services that the patient might need, uh, specifically to uh, specialized services if a referral is made. And of course, uh, clear instructions on how to get referrals if needed or how to seek uh, specialized care if needed. So I have another question for our attendees. So again, um, if, if you identify as a clinician or a patient or even a public health practitioner, however you are identifying right now, um, how do you identify your practice uh, patient-centeredness? So again, please uh, type your answers in the chat box. So if you're a clinician or if you identify right now as a patient or as a public health practitioner, just explain to me briefly in the chat box um, how do you identify with patient centeredness or how do you practice it? Or what does it mean to you as a clinician, patient, or as a public health practitioner? So you can just type your answer briefly using few words. <clears throat> so basically, one of the answer, um, like, Patient centered that centeredness is like patient is in the center of your care, uh, where you have to provide um, like empower your patient uh, empowerment, I think, and autonomy. Uh, I can like briefly uh, say like patient um, uh, being in the center. It means like autonomy, empowerment, patient inv involvement in the process itself. Um, 
patient education, uh, understanding patient beliefs, uh, attitudes, behaviors, uh, um, culture as well. And I see, I see, I think I see some answers yes. popping up on the right. Yeah. Patient, yeah. Uh, patient included in the planning of management. Okay, very good. Very good. Yeah. So basically, it's it's really important to um, keep in mind that you know people have different perspectives depending, of course, on your role. So for a patient, it can mean that the care that they receive um, is in line with their values, preferences, and and preferences, and that those you know two things are respected, uh, and that the patient is treated as a whole person. If you're a clinician, uh, you may see patients centeredness as advocating for uh, your patient's uh, rights and to ensure that their needs are met. And then if you're a public health practitioner, you probably identify with this concept um, in that it should be less concerned with meeting the desires of an individual patient and rather focus on uh, addressing the social determinants of health, uh, which again, we would argue that these would prevent uh, more citizens uh, or more people from becoming patients in the first place. So again, perspectives uh, matter. So again, going back to the question that I asked you, you know, how do you how do you see what it looks like? Um, and of course, um, if you see, you know, these five areas around the the person in the middle, the orange person in the middle, and you'll see that supported um, self-management. I mean, these five areas were identified as the most important areas when it comes to patient-centeredness um, to patients. And so, of course, in addition to um, everything that you see on the slide, it's very important to basically include families where appropriate. Um, and then making sure that your staff um, um, are supportive and that they have to be well trained in communication and striving to again put people at the center of their care. Um, and then it's very important as well to make sure that the physical, cultural, and psychosocial environment of health services supports person centered care. Um, and of course, in order for us to practice uh, patient uh, patient uh, centered care or patient centeredness, it's it's very important that we like when we take into consideration diabetes and self management, that we empower and prepare patients to manage their care. So how do we do that? So it's very important to uh, to know how to um, help patients set goals, of course, um, smart goals. Um, how to identify barriers and how to monitor their own conditions. And of course, these practices should be based on sound theoretical uh, approaches. And of course, Dr. Ghadir is going to uh, talk more about that um, when she discusses theoretical approaches in diabetes self-management or theories in diabetes self-management. And Dr. Manada as well, she will address um, that too. Um, so there are a variety of tools um, and resources uh, to provide patients with reminders to manage their health. And once um, tools is basically based on Kleinman's work. So Kleinman basically, um, he developed the patient's um, exploratory model or EM for short in 1980. And he emphasized the importance of obtaining the patient's explanations or the, the patient's perceptions or voices of their illness. So basically, he referred to this uh, exploratory explanatory uh, model as uh, notions about the sickness and its treatment. And he basically explained that uh, patients and, and providers uh, that there is a gap between their perceptions when it comes to the sickness condition. So basically, patient illness aspect, okay, as an, in addition to not just the illness, but they also perceive it as the difficulties of living with the sickness condition. Um, however, uh, healthcare providers 
they look at the sickness as, you know, the disease version. And they look at the illness problems that are, you know, or the, the illness problems are usually disregarded or the difficulties that the patients go through are disregarded. So they look at the disease as a disorder. Again, that's where the biomedical, you know, uh, model comes in, right? So because of this gap in perceptions, um, that can result in adequate clinical care. It can result in uh, patient and family dissatisfaction with the professional care, and it can also lead to uh, patient's non-adherence to recommended treatment uh, regimen. So again, there, there has to be a way to, uh, to bridge this gap in, in, in perceptions between the patients, again, illness perception or aspect, and the disease version uh, for the provider. So again, he uh, Clements emphasized the importance of obtaining uh, the the patient's explanation perception five areas or questions basically. So um, uh, questions about the etiology of the disease, the time and mode of onset of symptoms, uh, the pathophysiology, the course of illness, and then the treatment for an illness episode. So one of the tools that he developed are basically these questions. So he's saying that if we ask, or if, if um, healthcare providers ask these questions to their patients, they would be able to bridge that gap and of course, improve patient outcomes. So um, uh, for example, what do you call your problem? What name does it have? Uh, what do you think has caused it? Uh, who do you think, or who do you think um, it started when it did? I'm sorry, not who, what, and uh, why do you think your sickness uh, does that to you and how does it work and so on. So very important to uh, ask these questions to the patient in order again to bridge that gap in perceptions. Um, so this is basically uh, the decision cycle for patient-centered glycemic management in type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to go over de in detail over it. Uh, Dr. Manal, again, was more of um, how diabetes self-management or how patient-centeredness fits in with diabetes self-management, but there are basically multiple points where patient-centeredness can be applied and practiced. And as, as you see in the center, the goals of care are basically to prevent complications and to optimize the quality of life um, of patients with um, diabetes. So um, Dr. Ghadir now will provide uh, more information about um, the theories in uh, behavior change and how they apply to diabetes um, self-management. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Diana, for the um, well informative presentation. So before we go to Dr. Ghadir, uh, we have like two questions, uh, if possible. Um, so when it comes to uh, patient uh, autonomy, when it comes to patient prognosis, so as you know that um, some people or in some cultures, they really don't like to involve patients uh, in their uh, prognosis, especially sometimes when a patient is at the end of their disease states. So do you think there are some um, methods to overcome um, this, um, uh, like addressing the patient uh, autonomy? Uh, any work have been done? Do you think this autonomy ha is practiced um, um, frequently or do you see like people usually try to uh, uh, avoid this autonomy issue, especially when it comes in, in terms of prognosis? So um, to answer your question, uh, there, there has to be, I think I mentioned this earlier, there, there has to be, um, I think a paradigm shift Mm -hmm. when it comes to respecting patients' autonomy. Um, I am not aware of any um, studies that were specifically done. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are. I just, I would have to like research it and get back sure. to you. Yeah. If anything has been done in relation to uh, the local culture or local context, but definitely a, a paradigm shift in, in the way uh, we think and um, or in the way, you know, healthcare professionals uh, uh, practice um, or respect the autonomy of the patient. In addition to uh, cultural competence, 
there is a big piece of uh, patient's autonomy when it comes to cultural competence. So I would I would definitely suggest more trainings and more um, yeah more trainings when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, respecting patient's autonomy. Sure. Thank because you so much. Cultural changes are probably the most challenging ones too. Sure, thank you. And the last question is, um, you have addressed the continuity of care. So, uh, like you have said, like uh, you have addressed that patients should be aware about the continuity of care, where they have to go uh, when they are, for example, discharged from a specific hospital, where they have to do follow up. So, do you think that um, uh, what's the role of, let's say, the healthcare system in continuity of care? Um, uh, I know a patient should be oriented, but do you think like um, uh, like facilities between different healthcare systems uh, and the network system itself? What do you think the role of the healthcare system itself in the continuity of care? So I definitely think that once the patient is discharged, uh, you know, continuity of care should should be implemented. Uh, a plan should be there, mm -hmm. absolutely, to basically follow up with the patients and. I think this is where, um, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, system to follow up uh, will be a great uh, maybe solution for um, for continuity of care. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, it's it's being implemented here as Dr. Manal is going to uh, address that. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Diana, for the very nice present uh, presentation. So uh, now we will go to Dr. Ghadir. I'll make you the presenter, Dr. Uh, Ghadir, so you can start sharing your uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Ghadir, you are muted. Uh, we can see your presentation. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Doctor, can you make it in presentation mode? Yes, just one minute, please. Okay. Yes, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining to our session today. Uh, as uh, Dr. Muna introduced me, my name is Ghadir Jayousi and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health. Um, you can see that I am squeezed among uh, my two colleagues uh, today in the presentation, but actually we're going to talk at, uh, and discuss together uh, a very important competency in uh, diabetes uh, self-management and in diabetes education which is applying behavior change theories and uh, patient empowerment when it comes again to diabetes self-management. So I have no conflict, no relationships or conflict of interest to declare. Uh, as a start, I would say that it, uh, it, it's well documented actually in the literature that effective diabetes self-management will always end up with better health outcomes for the patients. And with, uh, when we say better health outcomes, we, we, we're not only focusing on the, uh, you know, uh, your glucose uh, blood level, or we, we not focus only on uh, the, uh, your indices, your readings or whatever. We are actually talking about improvement on as a holistic and a physical, mental, and also a better quality of life for patients. Diabetes self-management by itself is actually very challenging because the disease itself is challenging to be handled and managed. Uh, it is, as we say always, uh, 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 it is the silent killer. So it is unpredictable. It's a disease that may uh, change uh, over time and uh, through the lifespan, and it's often uh, 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 psychologically demanding, requiring the patient to be educated, to be empowered, to have the confidence that and self-efficacy should always be improved so that uh, he can uh, uh, learn how to manage uh, the disease. Uh, the most important thing, and to follow up with what uh, Dr. Diana just mentioned, is that for you as a healthcare practitioner, 
you should have the competencies in patient centered care and health behavior change skills so that to provide the, uh, the needed skills for diabetes management for your patient. And this is what we will be focusing on uh, during this session. As you say, uh, according to, let's move to the next slide, uh, according to the uh, American Association of Diabetes Educators, uh, as you can see, uh, there are two sets of behaviors that uh, uh, considered under diabetes self-management. There are diabetes-related behaviors and there are lifestyle behaviors. Uh, uh, the key self-management behaviors are the one with the asterisk where we talk about blood glucose self-monitoring and problem solving, healthy eating, physical activity. Today, we are going to talk, as I said now, also about how we can support as health educators or diabetes educators, how we can support our patient to manage controlling these behaviors. So there are many competencies, but for my part, I'm gonna focus only on behavior change theories. Have you been applying theories in your practice? Do you apply theory? Do you apply theories in practice, behavior, specifically behavior change theories? If you can write also a specific type of theory you have applied, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Maybe the smoking cessation um, trans theoretical model behavior change theory or like smoking cessation or diet. Okay, yeah. that's one of them. Uh, change theory. Behavior change theories. We there are different types actually. They are well documented again in the literature, and they work on different levels. They so work on, yes, they work on individual level, which are the ones I will focus on in my lecture. There are others on group level, and there are others on social, cultural, and environmental level. So but for today. Yes. Yeah, we have also like um, social cognitive and motivational theory. Yes, yeah. we're going to talk about also motivational interviewing in this uh, lecture uh, uh, as a methodology that is actually well recommended in diabetes uh, education to empower patients with diabetes. Now, the role of theory, we're going to define theory in general, it is a set of interrelated constructs or concepts, definitions, propositions that help or that present a systematic view of the problem, the healthy problem, the phenomena. It's actually a, 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 a set of concepts that may help you explain why people behave in a certain way, why people are following this specific eating behavior, why people cannot quit smoking, why people are not active. All these risk factors associated with the health problem we are focusing on today. So, um, why they are useful? How theory can help you managing or supporting the uh, patients with diabetes? Theories are very important because they can provide you with the, the foundation, actually, uh, from which you can uh, support these patients in managing diabetes. It's like the lens that will help you understand the factors that shape the problem, understand the behavior at the end, and also from that evidence provided, you can tailor this towards uh, an effective health education session and try to empower and support your patient. As I mentioned today, we're going to focus on two theories, which are the health belief model and the trans theoretical model. Have you, if we, if we will start today about the health belief model, just that the, the main premise of this theory, uh, which is that uh, people behave in a certain way because of their perceptions. Because how they be, because of risk perception, because of a severity, a perception of severity, perception of a threat, uh, uh, their uh, how, the value actually also the value they place on a certain outcome. 
What if they change this behavior? What they will gain? What's the reward? What are the benefits? So this is at the end how we decide to follow a certain behavior and why we behave in a certain way. And this is very important actually in, 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 in managing diabetes and empower people to manage diabetes to understand that people are different. And people actually are, we have a huge diversity in our country here in Qatar. And theory will actually help you understand this diversity. People have different perceptions, people, and these perceptions are shaped by values, by cultural values, by religious values. And that's why we need to consider applying these theories to broaden your thinking, actually, about how people are different and how people can manage diabetes. Developed by psychologists from the US, and again, as we said, these are the main underlying assumption is that we place value on certain outcomes. What are the rewards and the expectances that we are expecting from changing a certain behavior? These are the mere constructs of the theory. And uh, I would like to define each construct so that you be familiar this, with this theory because it is very, uh, 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 well known again in the field to be implemented in the diabetes education and support uh, uh, patients in managing diabetes. So we have perceived susceptibility, which is their perception regarding risk. Are they vulnerable or they are at risk or they are exposed to have this problem if they follow certain behavior or not? And then what could be the harm if they follow this certain behavior, which is perceived severity? What are the consequences? Then following that, we can talk about the benefits. What are the rewards, as we mentioned before? But on the other hand, we need to understand what to prevent them from following a certain behavior. This is very important so that we can work with them in reducing these barriers and empower them to manage these uh, uh, prohibitors, let's say, and barriers. Meanwhile, we need to focus also on uh, uh, what are the, uh, the factors that may support them to go through the change process. These factors may come from inside, from uh, themselves, from the patient, him or herself. And that's what we call it the internal power the internal attitude toward making the change. But there are other cues which are external factors, which can be represented by families, which is a strong also predictor uh, for uh, and a powerful, has a powerful influence on managing different chronic diseases, including diabetes. Uh, another construct that it's also will be commented in the literature, which is uh, self-efficacy which is very important in the health belief model, which is as, as, as healthcare provider, you need to work with patients to uh, uh, improve their self-confidence in managing diabetes. So these are the constructs which I just defined. And um, I just found that it's uh, better to talk about them while presenting the figure. Uh, I have a question now for you or a case study, and uh, I hope that you will interact uh, with, uh, with us and uh, write your answers uh, in the chat box. So after talking about these concepts, what if a patient who has recently been diagnosed with diabetes type 2 attended your clinic for the first time? The patient has a family history in diabetes with most cases around him or her are suffering or even have passed away because of the complications of the disease. As a consequence, the patient has really came with you to you with negative beliefs and attitudes toward managing diabetes and controlling the complication of the disease. How can you deal with this patient? So you can type your uh, answers uh, briefly in the, the chat. So um, I think maybe you can um, 
um, assess his understanding of the real disease itself and the proper management, uh, how to avoid complications. Maybe he has, let's say, beliefs from uh, the past or from his family history, uh, but he doesn't have the uh, real uh, information of the, about the disease itself and that it can be man manageable, maybe. Okay. So assess sure. his uh, knowledge level. Yes. Muhammad, fears and wrong conceptions. Yeah, explore his fears and wrong conceptions of complications. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other answers. So keep the theory in your mind, please. All these answers are great. I just want you also to think about what we just mentioned. So see is the, the map or the lens that we are using here now to analyze this case. What can you do? How can you deal with this case? Uh, so one of the answers, engage him with other uh, patients with positive attitudes. Yes. Good. Share like successful stories. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you consider okay. uh, group education as one of the um, process. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Group support, that's right. So uh, just if we will apply now the health belief model or what just we've been talking about, one of the key messages is that we need to tell the patient that you can have diabetes, but diabetes doesn't have to have you, shouldn't actually have to have you. Now, uh, uh, um, uh, the most important, the pace for how to deal with that patient is to try to provide the information on how you can on the risk factor reduction as all you uh, mentioned this in your answers and what could be the benefit of the behavior change so it's about educating them about how they can manage those risk factors that they are having whatever it is obesity uh, body weight uh, management uh, sedentary lifestyle smoking uh, all these risk factors and what's the benefit of changing the behavior. This should be emphasized as a baseline when you uh, start your session with the patient. Address the bar barriers. What they prevent you actually from following these behaviors, the healthier ones, right? What are the barriers and work with the patient on alleviating or uh, reducing these barriers? The thing you just talk about, one of the participants, as I read, which is the active problem solving. This should be a very interactive session between you as a healthcare provider, diabetes educator, and the patient to improve his skills actually in uh, uh, managing the disease. Um, and one of these basic, basic you know, skills, the hand on instructions about how he can. Uh, have the self glucose testing. This is glucose level by himself, having the uh, insulin uh, injection by himself, uh, um, preparing a healthy meal by her, himself or herself, uh, try to uh, be on a plan to uh, quit smoking. So these are very basic skills that you may start with your patient on to help him or alleviate the uh, get rid of the beliefs or the negative attitudes, success stories, as you just mentioned, and also the follow up and the uh, to manage and control the disease. Yeah. So, Dr. Ghadir, um, so one of the participants provided comments. So I think it's in alignment with the uh, points you have you have just mentioned. Um, yes. To understand patient beliefs and feelings, and without dismissing his fears, counsel the patient and reassure him of the success of the process. Yes. Great. The, these are all will come actually in the third part of my lecture, which is about empowerment and motivational interviewing. But that's all a great answers. Thank you so much because I'm trying just to apply the constructs of the theory, but definitely you are on the right uh, page and we are on the same page. Uh, the health belief model, as we mentioned, the last construct is self-efficacy, which is about the confidence of the person. And since you mentioned this, we keep talking about improve self-confidence, empower, and uh, enhance self-efficacy. How can we do that with our patients? What do you do? 
what are practical steps that you actually do? We don't want to keep talking, uh, you know, theory, theory all the time. We want, how do you practice this in your office, in your place? Um, maybe again, the patient uh, being at the center of the care, provide patient centered education. Yeah. Um, um, give them skills. Yes. Uh, empower patient with knowledge and skills again. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to, I'm, I'm going to give you some practical, you know, uh, steps about how you can improve self efficacy for your patients. Number one, you will master some skills for your patients, which is very important as one of the participants just mentioned. Practice some skills and also break the task down into small steps, small tasks and ask the patient to uh, practice each step by itself and then also, you know, re-encourage, reinforce the participant and if he or she succeed, that will be like you are celebrating the success. This is very important. Among these skills, it's uh, practicing, for example, reading food labels and how they are, you know, managing eating healthy meals. Uh, role play ordering food from restaurants, you know, currently because of the pandemic, we are uh, changing some uh, actually uh, there are major changes in our eating behavior. So we need to follow up and teach them some skills about how they can. Make healthy choices by ordering from some restaurant menus, participate in some exercises, role play, asking physicians questions about medications. Uh, uh, and recommended medic medications to control the disease. This is very important. When uh, do not, uh, 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 when you want to enhance self-efficacy, you always need to give a practical solutions and let them uh, practice some skills. Social persuasion, it's like what we just mentioned, but it's about also uh, celebrating the success of that person if he accomplish any changes. That's very important, you know, just to say that you are on the right track, you're doing a great job, when, uh, especially if uh, he was able to make any behavior changes uh, concerning physical activity, eating behavior, and other behaviors, uh, you know, uh, considered risk factors for the issue. Uh, same here for physiological factors. Um, uh, the, how you build it's actually has a significant role in building self-efficacy is that when the patient is reporting to you that his symptoms are improving, he is having actually uh, fewer uh, symptoms compared to before because he is following some changes. He is changing his behavior, whatever it is, and that's something very important to reinforce these changes. Yeah, and keep up the good work, you are on the right track and keep following these changes. And another, another concept, which is social modeling, it has actually been a key strategy to influence their behavior, which is one of the participants or Dr. Mona just mentioned, learn from others, meet others. So here we are talking about the group, the support group, we, uh, as, as it is actually one of the health uh, diabetes education uh, methods uh, that is recommended to uh, empower people uh, managing the disease. This is all about the health belief model. Do you have any question about it? Questions? Uh, so, Dr. Ghadir, uh, maybe here we have a question when it comes to the outcome of applying the behavior change uh, theory. Yes. So, sometimes we might have like two outcomes. Sometimes you can lose the patient interest uh, during yeah. the whole process. And on the other hand, sometimes you can have positive outcome. So yes. how you can maintain the positive, uh, like sometimes if you change, maybe if you see a positive change, you might leave the patient and that's it. Or do you advise you have to keep following up with the patient? And if patient 
lose interest in in, uh, in the theory. So what's the uh, proper approach to address uh, these two um, um, issues? Uh, whatever the case, Dr. Mona, even if you lose them, you lose them, or if you really have a successful uh, intervention and you have an outcome, follow up, follow up, follow up is the key. We have witnessed many cases when it comes to the uh, weight management, when it comes to uh, any behavior change, reinforcement, motivation, and we're going to talk again about now one of the methods, which is motivational interviewing. Keep assessing the needs of the patient. They're going to change over time because factors, other factors may come in the way which we were not considering. So continuous needs assessment or patient assessment, and that takes us back to Dr. Diana, the, the uh, uh, patient-centered approach. It's the patient needs that may be changing over time that we need to track. Tracking, monitoring, following up with the patient. These are the key for successful uh, management uh, of uh, and control of the disease. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. The next very interesting theory, actually, and again, it is as Dr. Muna, she gave it as an example, and I know others uh, among you uh, knowledgeable or know about this theory, and hope, I hope they applying this theory actually, uh, which is the trans-theoretical model. Uh, first, to be used be in tobacco cessation, that's right. Uh, but then now uh, it is well known, documented again in the diabetes uh, uh, self-management. Uh, in this theory, and before talking more about it, uh, um, um, one reason that we, we may think about people are at different stages in the change process of any behavior. That's why applying this theory, which we're going to define now, is very important. What does this mean? What does it mean that people are the reason or one reason that some people may succeed in a behavior change or lifestyle change? Because this is related to in which stage they are in that change. What does this mean? What does this mean? Yeah, uh, willingness to change. Yes. Um, you cannot deal as a healthcare provider. You cannot deal with patients with your diabetes patients with diabetes, uh, and start with them uh, as if they are in the same stage of a change. Right? Mm -hmm. How this will make a difference for you? Um, maybe the uh, um, the interventions that you have to follow in um, in each stage. Yes, that's, that's right. Mm. True. Any other answers? Any other answers? So I I don't want to uh, to take too much. Uh, the patient engagement would be better if you consider. Um, yeah, so patient engagement. That's true, because if you when you engage patients, you know more about where are they in the change process, what struggles they face. That's true. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Prof. Casta and De Clementi in the 1970s they developed this theory which is very interesting because it's showing that behavior change happened in stages and it's a process and it's taking time. So, uh, uh, and the, 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 uh, as we said, people actually, while they are going through this change process, they may relapse. They may go back to the previous stage where they started all the way at the beginning. And that's why Dr. Muna's question and your question about how it's very important in behavior change is keep monitoring and following up with the patient because of this, these relapses that may happen to you during the changing process. So here is our model. It's from six stages. 
you can see that each stage depends on the other one. And we also can see they are, they are interrelated. There is relapse, not actually as one stage as it is here in the model. Relapse is seen during each stage of this change process. So if we will talk about them, the, the pre-contemplation uh, stage is where there is no desire at all to make any change. The patient doesn't think even about making any change in eating behavior, in physical activity, in uh, um, smoking. So no change till there is a trigger that come in his way. For example, he watched something on the TV, a friend share an educational material, he was in the healthcare system and somebody talked to him about, or maybe he was on the balance and his body weight jumped up. So there is contemplation now. The second stage, he's thinking about making a change. While he's visiting you in the clinic, and you notice that he gained uh, too much weight, he's not active, there are some maybe cardiovascular issues starting going on, high blood pressure. So that could be also, as we said, the trigger. And then we start the preparation process where you actually put a goal for that patient to follow, a goal and a plan, a certain plan that he needs to follow, he or she needs to follow to manage diabetes. Following that, which is the action, he's actually following a certain plan, which, is, which can be a diet plan by the dietitian, in the diabetes education unit, for example, and then we move on to en enhancing physical activity. He's attending the gym more than before, or maybe buying a machine at home. All these are actually starting exercising on the machine. That's action. He's following that he's changing the behavior. The maintenance is where stage is where there is a uh, uh, he's maintaining the healthy and new behavior. And that's where we go on uh, uh, um, not 100% because there is another stage actually, which is termination, we call it, which is not in our uh, figure here, but it is the last stage where there is completely uh, 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 termination of the previous unhealthy behavior and following of the healthy behavior. So, so Dr. Um, uh, Radir, yes. here we have a comment from um, yep. participant. So um, sometimes death of closed relative or diabetes or developing heart attack or any serious complication is giving like alert to the patient to seek advice. Definitely. Yeah. There are many examples. That's true. True. Mm -hmm. And this is what the case study actually, if we have time, we can elaborate on it where because I said some relatives for that patients passed away actually from the complications that could be a trigger. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you move from pre contemplation to contemplation. If you are, for example, we're not thinking, but now you have that trigger. Yes, you start definitely. That's a good example. Thanks for the participant. And then we start about the preparation as we mentioned some examples. And then also the action process, which is where the person actually has me made meaningful change. Now, as you can see, there is a, a, a period of time here. We mentioned six months. <coughs> How did come up with this uh, yani, period of time? It's because of, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, and it, it, it's actually from real life experience supporting people quitting the smoking and going uh, through the change process so uh, they 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 found that uh, uh, they re read for example to maintain the behavior change they need six months or more actually uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know facing zero relapse and maintain that change you need at least from at least six months uh, to uh, maintain this healthy behavior this is the last stage where I mentioned, which is the termination. What I mentioned that where there is no temptation to relapse, zero temptation to relapse. You there is a, 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 a complete whole uh, uh, um, behavior change. You are now completely adopting uh, the new behavior and zero temptation to relapse. 
So, so Dr. Ghazi, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, also a comment. This is additional comment on when it comes to education uh, for diabetic educator in particular. So yes. they should address the uh, public awareness, increasing public awareness and involvement of other healthcare providers about diabetes management that actually can help in, uh, people with diabetes to maintain the change. Yes, actually, if we go back, the role of health educator, diabetes educator, in each stage of the theoretical model, they have a very significant role. So, in the pre-contemplation, this is what you just mentioned, providing education. When a patient is coming with a friend, and you know, you just provide that educational session, educational material, sharing uh, SMS with that patient, and this how this will trigger him from starting thinking about the change process. The other stages of the trans theoretical model, again, which with, with the, what you talk about, is should the role of the diabetes educator is all about monitoring and reinforcement and motivation and empowerment during all these stages follow up and address the needs of the patient you are in your office and you don't know how he or she is struggling so whenever you meeting here each visit assess the needs and try to address the needs and tailor the needs of the patient towards the session towards the, uh, you, know, you know, a specific educational uh, method. طبعا, that needs another whole lecture or, you know, about diabetes education methods, but I know uh, Dr. Manal will address this. Questions, any questions? Can you share any experience in your uh, setting where you apply trans theoretical model? Some of the concepts. Maybe uh, let's like make this. Um, sometimes we unconsciously uh, follow these uh, theories, uh, but maybe not in a structured way. So even if you apply it, like not necessarily following the model, so you can share that with us. Yes, please. Yeah, like from my experience, I used to apply the trans theoretical model in smoking cessation clinic. Yes. Uh, yes. And sometimes, as you said, it depends on patient uh, readiness to change. Uh, if they have uh, any struggle in the during the um, process itself, the relapse. So um, you really need the close follow up, um, yes. uh, always follow up with your patient. And um, sometimes, it, some sometimes it's difficult to address patients' uh, maybe concerns or fears. Yes. But um, again, the relapse issue, it was like sometimes difficult to be managed. But again, with the, uh, like um, sometimes we have to use the motivational interview. Yes. Maybe I think you will address the motivational interview later yes. on. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Accompanied by uh, Yani, accompanied by these theories also is the motivational interviewing. Yani, you are applying these theories in practice but you are also uh, uh, will always be in need of implementing uh, motivational interviewing each time you are meeting your patient. So here we have comment, um, motivating patient with diabetes and obesity and how reducing weight may reduce the complication and changing the lifestyle. Definitely, definitely. We're gonna talk about motivational interviewing because again, it is, it is embedded everywhere um, in these models. So we have another comment. Uh, staying completely non-judgmental helps telling them uh, we uh, are asking them to stop this habit or modifying behavior because it's harming them. Otherwise, we are uh, no one to judge whether it's good or bad. Definitely. So we are heading now, you are uh, pushing me toward motivational interviewing and I completely agree with you because uh, uh, with these theories, as we said, I'm repeating myself, but because this is very important, there should be always reinforcement, empowerment, and uh, uh, motivation. So we assessing the patient needs, keeping the patient needs in the center, re relating this to what Dr. Diana just mentioned and empowering them. So we will talk about one of the most important, actually, uh, uh, very important methodology in diabetes education, which is motivational interviewing. I know, as again, Dr. Mona just mentioned, is that uh, 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 unconsciously you are following this. 
but we are here just to trying to organize your thoughts and uh, you know put the foundation the foundation of uh, the techniques you are our theoretical foundation uh, for those methods you are following and implementing in your uh, clinic or place so um well, you know, they have patients with diabetes, they, they feel they are uh, uh, stressed, they are uh, uncomfortable, they feel they are embarrassed, actually. And they feel they are blamed for maybe having the disease itself because they are overweight, they are smoking, they, are, they don't have, uh, uh, they are not active. Uh, they don't have clear health values in their life. So the blaming, the, 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 the embarrassing is, is there actually. And so in order to help a patient to make a change or go through the change process, it's actually a package. You have a package here it requires mental effort, self-efficacy, a desire. A desire. This is very important. And as the example you just mentioned, like if a tragedy happened related to that disease uh, in the family, or you're losing a, a, a person, a close person, uh, that will actually, uh, the, the context, the fear context, the sad context, what's happening in your life may uh, be a trigger and make you feel it's very important to go through the change process. Right, and so healthcare providers, this is your responsibility, is to focus on increasing that motivation and that desires. Keep the spirit that they want to make a change. They may alert Dr. Amuna. They may it, it may faint. We may lose them, and this is your job. This is where you need to keep tracking. This is where you need to keep monitoring that change process. So, so uh, if we uh, talk more about this, is that uh, uh, motivation by itself, uh, you know, can come from uh, inside that person, self-generated, intrinsic, or others can also cause this uh, motivation or enforce it. And so, uh, um, there are other factors I don't want to head down. I know Dr. Manel will talk about the social, cultural, and economic actual context. There are theories actually which address these factors, but again, for time limitation, I'm just only addressing individual uh, theories. Uh, motivational interviewing, it's a patient-centered approach relating to Dr. Diana was just addressed. So it's all about, and I, I really appreciate your comments in the chat box, and which is very promising that you are actually following this methodology in your practice. So it is about uh, enhancing intrinsic motivation uh, to change and exploring also and resolving the ambivalence that a patient may face being more collaborative, explorative in nature, drawing ideas and insights. You are assessing the needs of the patient, the concerns, and in addition to that, you are rolling or motivating the change, right? So uh, it, it, it is, at the end, it is the responsibility of the patient to change. It is the desire, it is, all about the freedom of choice. We need to be careful about it, right? Because this is a very interesting, there is a very interesting quote here actually about motivation and interviewing in healthcare that although you are trying to motivate and you are trying to encourage, at the end, it's all about autonomy and the autonomy and the freedom of choice, right? That will actually because the patient will notice that you are giving that freedom to him or her, this will motivate him or her to go through the change process. And this is this is also I just don't want I mean we I, I don't want to um, repeat myself, but motivational interviewing it promotes that person desire for the change in the patient, right? So. It is built on the work of 
the, you know, uh, previous theories. We just mentioned the trans theoretical model, right? And so there should be that relationship between you as a healthcare provider, a continuous relationship, uh, and the patient. There should be no judging. One of the participants just mentioned this, which is very important. Don't be judgmental. You need actually to listen carefully to the patient concerns and try to reflect on these concerns. Try to find answers to his questions. Try to be a resource for him or her, because this is your job. In addition to show always, you know, that do not argue. That's very important. Listen carefully to him. And at the end, you will, you know, provide you are a resource and you will provide tips and solutions to move on and address the concerns. This is, this is, these are the major principles of motivational interviewing. And they are very important if you are, if you think you are following this methodology or this strategy in your clinic, be careful about these, these five principles. Number one, express empathy and acceptance. Listen carefully. And you just mentioned this, and you know, I don't want to keep asking are you, I mean, you if you're following, because in your comments, and I'm, I'm really very, very, uh, uh, um, you show just very rich uh, uh, answers showing that you are implementing these methods in clinic. Um, develop discrepancy, which is be clear about the goal now. This is the goal. This is what you are facing now, and this is what you want to accomplish. That's very important to make a clear goal and clear scenario and a plan for what's coming. Uh, what are you aiming to do? And then uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the motivation and the clarification without uh, 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 seeking the explanation from that patient, the elaboration here from the patient, because you need to have rich information and rich understanding of their challenges and concerns. And again, you mentioned all this in the chat box, and I appreciate that. Do not argue without, you know, a, a specific, uh, um, don't argue without any, uh, uh, don't confront, don't argue with the patient. At the end, He's the one who's facing challenges and you are a resource to solve these challenges and issues. We talk about self-efficacy and how it's important. And then at the end, it's all about that person, the patient himself, who is going to decide about the change process and about that he's gonna go through the change. So, um, 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 in addition to the, the to the principles, the most important and what makes this methodology again, uh, in addition to empowerment, to motivation, you are addressing the needs, the concerns, is that the type of the questions you are asking the patient. So when you are with the patient, let him or ask for elaboration and the probing and rich answers because this is very important. Support and confirm that uh, and reinforce and carefully listen. Uh, all these are skills are very important for you as a healthcare provider to have when you are conducting motivational interviewing. At the end, you are a resource. You summarize what you have from the, uh, the, the patient and uh, you provide your plan or your goal. My last, uh, my last slide for today actually is uh, what is uh, in the field about how effective is motivational interviewing approach. And um, there is actually one of the recent uh, published uh, systematic review uh, about uh, how effective are these interventions. The results showed that there is a minimal improvement and I know, I know Ms. Manel will definitely actually talk to or point about this, which is improvement in your, uh, you know, uh, glucose level or hemoglobin A1C, 
uh, uh, and other diabetes outcomes, but there is also significant, very significant and positive change on lifestyle when it comes uh, when implementing this method uh, for diabetes self-management. Um, what I would like to say at the end before, uh, you know, uh, uh, handling uh, the mic now to my colleague Manel, is that although the methodology is um, didn't show big or significant improvement in hemoglobin A1C or other uh, indices, yani at the end, improving the lifestyle will improve the, the whole, yani quality of life for these patients, which will have a, a very a, a huge influence actually on mental health and psychological well-being, which at the end will, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, lead to uh, changes that achieve the diabetes goals, the long-term goals we are looking for or we are aiming for. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any question, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ghadir, for your uh, rich and informative presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much for uh, So I think we don't have further questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we can hand the mic to Dr. Manal. So you are the presenter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you in this session. Uh, and thank you for my colleague, Dr. Juliana, and Dr. Ghadir for the informative the presentation. Uh, I will start that I don't have any relationship or conflict of interest to declare. Uh, and uh, as we know, uh, we receive a very sort of critical background for uh, the diabetes self-management and the importance of patient care. But uh, um, I will yes, Mr. Yeah, yeah, your voice is, uh, is not clear. Can you come closer? To uh, one minute. Yeah. So that's all. Uh, so I will start my presentation with the history of uh, diabetes education. and I will uh, would like to ask my uh, attendees, do you think this is still the voice? Um, yes, the voice is not clear. Good evening, everyone. Better now the one? Yeah. I will start my presentation with the history of diabetes management. So the diabetes self-management is not a new aspect uh, introduced to the healthcare management. Maybe, maybe my sound is okay, or maybe Dr. Hadir, she didn't mute herself or what i am muted uh, huh? my sound is it good? yes yes uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah keep talking dr Manal. okay thank you so dr watchard he was the first who occupied the important self-management self-monitoring and education in uh, 1855, yes. and that was for the uh, he recognized the importance of the clinical outcome in the patient in diabetes self management and was involved with diabetes self uh, education. Uh, UK was the first country who uh, approved the service 
1940 for the Ministry of Education from the Libido. And in 1973, the American Association for the Ministry of Education was established uh, from multi team. And we will know the, what multi team from the uh, slides. And uh, that followed by the uh, Ministry of Education was recognized as a specialty in 19. Uh, then in 1990, the evidence of education and discipline team as an essential part for secondary education uh, type. In 2000, the diabetes management education introduced and identified the self care behaviors and empowerment that each patient or each uh, person living with diabetes he should be educating and uh, introducing his self-care because it's important for him to improve his quality of life. In 2018, the support for diabetes management education of aspects and was identified by task force group from American Association of Diabetes Education and American Association for uh, American Diabetes Education. And the important thing for support is that this disease is accomplished, as my colleague, Adir, she mentioned. And it's a long term disease, needs a lot of management from the patient and from the system, as well as the community, like works, like schools, universities. So they had the effect of support to uh, maintain the behavior change and reduce the improve the clinical outcome and uh, reduce the, the complication for the disease. When we come to the definition, diabetes was uh, self-measured um, um, uh, defined, defined in the literature was uh, um, uh, the process uh, facilitating the knowledge, skill, uh, and ability necessary for diabetes self -measure. So it is not knowledge or information. It is the three aspects, knowledge, skills, abilities, and empowerment needed that the patient, uh, for the patient to uh, live safely with this disease and avoid any complications. And what we mean by the disease self-management support is any activity that assists implementation of training these behaviors needed, the self-care behaviors needed to manage diabetes. And the combination or combination of education, diabetes self management and support with inclusion of support in the most recent update in national standards for diabetes self management education and support, this is now the preferred technology for any diabetes management education uh, program. Uh, Dr. Manar? Yes. Uh, Dr. Can you just um, switch off his video, the camera? Okay. So we might have the uh, internet connection. Okay. Okay, thank you. The evidence from meta-analysis showed that diabetes self-management education and support improved diabetes self-care behaviors, better clinical results, better clinical Increase the usage of a primary and preventive service and reduce the burden on the secondary and tertiary health system. Reduce the hospitalization and visit and increase the financial of diabetes mention. And uh, when we will come to compare diabetes health management education, many uh, with the golden treatment of diabetes, which is the form. Do you think, is there any comparison between both? Which one you prefer? The audience, do you think the diabetes self-management education, we can compare it with metformin, which is the goal of the treatment for diabetes type 2? So I think, Dr. Manal, we have some issue with the voice. Um, just give me one minute. Okay.
Uh, Doctor, madam, do you have phones or something you can use? Sorry, Doctor, madam. Second, do you have um a mic you can use or headphone? Headphone? Yeah, or Ready. your mobile headphone, if possible. Doctor Mana? Uh, yes, Doctor Mana. Yes. Hello. Is better now the voice? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, my question for the audience Is there any comparison between diabetes self management education support and metformin? which is the golden treatment or golden medicine medication given for type 2 diabetes. Is there any answer in the chat box? Please uh, share it with us. So just to make sure our audience has a question. Um, do you prefer a DSMES pen or metformin? If the diabetes self management education is a bill, would you prefer or prescribe it? So maybe he has a different perspective behavior versus uh, medications. Yeah. I would be blessed for medications. <laughs> Now, if we will compare the benefit for the uh, diabetes self-management education and support compared to the golden uh, uh, treatment metformin uh, in, in relation to the efficacy, bo the, both are high, scored is high, and the hypoglycemia risk is low. The weight, it's neutral and loss, it could help people to uh, lose the weight even, similar to the metformin. In relation to the side effect, there is no any side effect for the patient. In rel uh, 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 but for metformin, there is uh, some GI uh, disturbances. In relation to the cost, we uh, the diabetes self management education is a very low cost, and it could save the uh, the save the money and save. For uh, the uh, anything, any bids uh, or any problem, and reduce the uh, admission to the hospital and visits for the emergency. Yeah. Uh, so, metformin, it's also low price, mm -hmm. uh, but for psychological or uh, psychosocial benefits, this, uh, the literature show that diabetes self management education support show a high score in terms of psychosocial benefits. This is which is not available with metformin as well. Okay, so, so then some of uh, the answers. So one recommend metformin and others recommending diabetes self management education. So and I think the guidelines, the first line is with this education and that's the main changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are the objectives of diabetes self management education and support? We aim to support informed decision making and to develop the self-care behavior plan and to help the patient and learn uh, teach them the problem solving skills and also the active collaboration with healthcare team it is an important they will be uh, part of the medical management team and they are in the center of the multidisciplinary team we will improve the diabetes self uh, will improve the clinical outcome and the health status and the quality of life on long run and on long term. 
what are the if we look for the outcome for the beat self management education most of the people or most of uh, the healthcare system thinking about the self management education it is only aiming for improving the knowledge and information for the patient but actually any diabetes self management education program have four level of outcome starting from improving the knowledge and the skills and learning uh, process when this uh, outcome is met will, that will be improve the behavior change and the self care behaviors so the patient will start to increase his physical activity uh, following the, his diet regimen taking his medication uh, testing his blood sugar and uh, he will be uh, able to solve any problem he may face it at work site or outside the healthcare system that will be reflected to improve the clinical improvement like clinical outcome or indicators like hemoglobin a1c blood pressure level levels and uh, other things that will be uh, take us when this met uh, to improve the general health status for the patient and the quality of life for uh, the patient and reduce the complication and absent teams from the work or the school what are the algorithm of care uh, when this diabetes self-management education is recommended do you think the audience is diabetes self-management education is recommended is there is any possible time or any uh, uh, specific time that uh, this aspects is recommended what is the diabetes self-management education support is needed at various times and by whom who can provide this diabetes self-management education and support and how does how is diabetes self-management education support best, best provided for the uh, patient uh, when they suffer from diabetes these are the main four uh, critical times that the diabetes self-management uh, support is provided uh, at diagnosis when the patient diagnosed with diabetes uh, diabetes they should be referred to diabetes educator and they should be introduced to an structured diabetes self-management program either face to face in uh, single uh, diabetes self-management education or in the group it is diabetes self-management education annually to assist his need as dr radir she mentioned usually we are uh, referring that we're receiving the case in annual basis and continue uh, in order to follow up with his management or any changes happen on his life when any new complication factors influence the self-management uh, uh, the case should be referred again to diabetes educator also when there is any transition in his care or care or in his life for example uh, she got pregnant uh, the, uh, um, the patient or for example he got married he he was uh, he is going to travel for study or something here the patient should be again referred to diabetes self-management education uh, clinic and uh, if uh, in terms of the describing the structured diabetes self-management education or what i mean by structured diabetes self-management education uh, that the literature show or evidence show that the structured diabetes self-management education ha should have a written curriculum and have a trained educators are able to provide this education in correct way theory based as we saw from uh, Dr. Ghadir and the quality assured monitored uh, to improve these uh, types of self-management and uh, to add any th uh, new things could be added for example now we are in the covid crisis we adapt something to a new lead for our diabetes self-management program we are looking to develop a virtual diabetes online education program to uh, to address the uh, these issues and these aspects during the lockdown during the patient when he if uh, there is any new the newly diagnosed case during the quarantine and he was not uh, for example referred before or uh, to diabetes self-management program so we need to update our programs according to the any new thing uh, happen uh, around 
Also, regularly audited is uh, very important, as I said, is uh, we have to keep updating uh, the programs and adding any new knowledge on information needed. Examples for structured program worldwide, we have diabetes self-management ongoing uh, for a newly diabetes, which is this program, and this is for type 2 diabetes, uh, and it's present and established in UK. Uh, we have expert program also for type 2 diabetes, and we have Daphne, which is for type 1 diabetes, and Berger as well for type 1 diabetes. So they are the major types of diabetes. I needed long-term follow-up. For that, we have a different uh, structured diabetes self-management program. And thanks, God, thank you for Hamad uh, administration and support. They support us to have this bond program in uh, Qatar. And if when we look to for the availability of these structured diabetes self-management education programs in Qatar, we will find in it's available in Al Khor Hospital, available in Hamad Hospital in Doha, and available Hamad Jal Hospital as well in Al Wakra uh, Hospital. Now, uh, uh, also as well in um, Saeed Hospital in Yuli, we uh, this is ad addressed. What we the diabetes self management education service targeting uh, three aspects because as I mentioned that we need to support this uh, management and we, we need to maintain the changes around the patient and environment. So diabetes educators are working with the three uh, targets or diabetes self management ed uh, education clinics. Uh, they are targeting the patient in their education, targeting the to update the healthcare provider with any new management or medical management or update in information related to the patient uh, medical man diabetes management. Also, we need to target our service, the community around uh, the, uh, the patient and people living with diabetes. And we have also uh, for patient service, uh, as I told you, this is the, our multidisciplinary diabetes self-management team. And if uh, we look here, the patient and his family are in the center, and uh, diabetes educator is second uh, person and uh, after the physician role. And uh, here are uh, moving uh, also the podiatrist and the teacher, nurse, psychologist are all are very important members. This because the type of the complexity of the diabetes need a multidisciplinary management, and all of us we are sharing the uh, uh, medical care plan, and we are also helping the patient and his family to reach and uh, uh, sustain his uh, goals and uh, to reduce the complication. Now, in terms of the benefits of multidisciplinary approach, several study uh, showed that it improved the glycemic control improve the quality of life for those people living with diabetes, and it improved the patient follow-up and continuity of care. Also, it's improved the patient satisfaction and reduced the risk of complication and reduced the cost in the healthcare system and the burden. How the patient can access in Qatar to diabetes self-management education service? We have a patient can be referred if he is admitted to the ward in inpatient area by referral on the CERNAR system. We have a different diabetes education clinic across the Hamad Medical Corporation, moving from Al Khor in the north to the south in uh, Al Wakra. Uh, also, we have a diabetes hotline support uh, managed by the a trained diabetes educator, and uh, we will share one case from our hotline later in the presentation. Uh, in terms of the structured patient education program, as I mentioned, uh, that Hamad Medical Corporation and the health system supporting, very well supporting the diabetes uh, self-management approach. And we are only the country in uh, the MENA region having a structured diabetes self-management program, which is this model program. Also, we have a people who are trained to use the conversation map tool, which is considered also type of structured diabetes self-management program. In, uh, this is for group education. And in terms of one-to-one -one, uh, education, we have a curriculum approved and uh, adapted from American Association of Diabetes Educator, and it's uh, translated also in Arabic. And we are working now to move to the virtual, uh, for this curriculum to the virtual uh, portal to help the patient, as I told you, during the quarantine. Uh, period. 
in terms of the what are the aspects we are talking with the patient about uh, the the diabetes self management program usually we will start after the assessment and uh, address his need these are starting from uh, identifying the patient with the pathophysiology of the disease in a simple way, moving to the uh, types of the disease that he has it, the diabetes, and importance of physical activity and diabetes, moving to the meal planning regimen and monitoring and importance of uh, follow-up with the other uh, aspects in the clinic or monitor his uh, retina, also monitor his uh, urine albumin, rush, um, albumin, uh, albumin ratio, in addition to the daily monitoring for uh, checking his blood glucose. Uh, the medication, how to use it and how to uh, side effect of this uh, medication, also it's one of the curriculum aspects that diabetes educator usually address it in one-to-one -one basis for the patient. Insulin bump, it's another aspect. Also, we will consider hypo and hyperglycemia management and signs and symptoms, how to manage other diseases like influenza, like uh, developing gastroenteritis, other common diseases with diabetes, what to do, because we need to empower him to handle this disease uh, independently from the healthcare system. Also, we are addressing this aspect. The complication, either chronic or acute complications, uh, how to take care of his uh, uh, feet, and also we are addressing uh, some aspects related to the woman, like paparazzi status or pregnancy planning uh, for the uh, related to the woman or menopausal status. In addition, we are addressing some special occasions like Hajj or traveling or fasting with diabetes. Uh, in, uh, also, it's followed with herbal use and alternative medicine use because some patients they are uh, having some uh, aspects, uh, wrong aspects or myth regarding uh, diabetes, and we have to educate them uh, uh, very good, especially in our culture uh, regarding this uh, aspect. Immunization, it's also another aspect that uh, uh, a patient uh, introduced to the patient uh, in terms of maintaining his flu vaccine annually or other uh, vaccines needed like COVID vaccine now or for example, pneumococcal vaccine according to the, uh, our national and international guidelines. These aspects it's handled not in one session for sure. It will be moved from session to session according to the patient priority and needs, and also according to the time and preference for the patient, as we mentioned before. Now I would like to share this uh, real case study was uh, 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 follow, uh, referred to diabetes educator in inpatient. Mr. Uh, uh, M.E. was diagnosed in April 30, uh, 2020 as type 2 diabetes and uh, his uh, hemoglobin A1C was 12.9 percent. He was admitted to Hamad General Hospital to manage his diabetes and he was seen in inpatient setting by diabetes educator in May 3rd. Uh, given the survival education uh, during uh, his hospitalization and uh, usually before discharge we will provide the patient with a plan. One of the plan will provide him also uh, the hotline number to keep supporting him uh, for the, uh, his uh, management uh, outside the health setting. Uh, the patient was discharged on basal insulin, glargin, I think, and bolus insulin, which is short-acting insulin, and appointment booked for him in December 8 with the physician clinic. So uh, almost there is around seven months after discharge. The self-monitoring was followed by diabetes hotline educator using insulin titration protocol, which our educator usually trained very well on this protocol, and this is matching with our national guidelines. As you notice here from our CERNR, the uh, patient discharge with uh, or admitted with the 12.9 on uh, April 30 and referred for us in May, as I mentioned for you, and he was seen by diabetes uh, educator in inpatient setting. Uh, now, the patient, when he's uh, uh, discharged, uh, he was uh, given an appointment on December 8 as I mentioned, and appointment with diabetes education clinic according to the next availability, it is in February 2021. For that, uh, the diabetes hotline, given the number for the patient, 
and the patient uh, and he was advised to monitor his blood sugar and he was uh, contacting the diabetes hotline. If you notice how many education notes between the, his discharge from May 3rd to December uh, 7, he was uh, continuously followed by diabetes educator uh, through the hotline service. Now, uh, this is the self-monitoring sheet. And if you notice here that the patient was discharged on glargine or basal insulin with the 24 units as estimated from the physician and as part or uh, novorabide with eight units TID. Uh, if you notice the patient reading here that uh, before breakfast, he's uh, uh, having some low side blood sugar, 61, 81, 83, and uh, postprandial, sometimes the readings between uh, normal 148 or high like 188 or 177. And usually the target postprandial from 80 to 160. With the close follow up due, uh, through the diabetes hotline, uh, the diabetes educator was able to uh, come when uh, to reduce the HbA1c, the continuity of care by diabetes educator and the hotline uh, from 12.9 to 6.4, which is a huge improvement. Uh, if we will imagine that there was there was no diabetes educator rule uh, to bridge the gap between the discharge of the patient and uh, the appointment uh, next appointment with his physician, this patient either he will develop hyper or hypoglycemia and he will continue uh, repeating visiting the to emergency or he will be hospitalized again for the acute uh, complications. The literature show that the reduction of HbA1c by 1%, it will improve, reduce the death by 21% related to diabetes. Also, it will reduce the microvascular uh, complication by 37%. Uh, in addition, that it will reduce the myocardial infarction and microvascular uh, complication by 14%. So uh, the reduction in HbA1c is very important. Even 0.5 reduction, some bills are working, which is costly, very costly uh, bills. Uh, it may improve the HbA1c by 0.5 or 0.3, but the continuity of care and the education and self-management was able to reduce the hemoglobin A1c more uh, uh, almost 6 percent from 12.9 to 6.5. So this is uh, a highlight that the diabetes self-management is very important and we need to empower this career uh, by education and uh, engage the diabetes self-management more in the health system, especially in the primary care. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, that we adapt Dismond program in uh, 2016 and seven educators that time was uh, uh, trained and accredited. And Qatar is the first country, as I said, in the MENA region. And uh, this was uh, translated into Arabic in 2017. And first paper was submitted and accepted as a poster and presentation uh, for an international diabetes federation, but in unfortunately due to blockage, we were not able to present uh, that because it was held in Dubai. Uh, this is the curriculum uh, for uh, this program. It's similar to the one-to-one uh, um, -one curriculum. It concentrate in changing patient behavior and uh, elaborate the uh, food choices, uh, empower the patient how to choose and how to uh, create his uh, healthy meal and how to monitor his blood sugar and follow this and reduce the stress and emotion and the overwhelm that the patients sometimes are feel when they are diagnosed with uh, this diabetes. This is also another example of a structured patient education, which is the conversation map tool. And we have trained educators in different titles living with diabetes, how diabetes work. Each map has different titles and usually it's a group uh, education, uh, five to 10 patients. They will have, uh, they will sit with the educators and they will be educated in different aspects related to diabetes. And it's very useful, uh, interactive, visual and verbal tool uh, to engage the people with diabetes and they will fear uh, more, uh, they will feel more confident when they uh, participate and share their uh, experience with their 
colleague. This is examples, real examples from our, uh, our activity. If you see the attendance here is very high and uh, it's from multi-ethnic and nationality population in Qatar. Uh, in terms of healthcare provider service, we were able our unit to uh, develop a di local diabetes self-management education course in collaboration with North Atlantic. And this course uh, recently developed to be, uh, inshallah, it will be launched in September to be master in diabetes education, and it's approved by our health ministry and education ministry. Also, we were able to develop diabetes education foundation course to uh, empower our nurses because the patient he may admit it to the floor in any time, and we want to update and empower the nurses with the new uh, and medical management related to, to diabetes. Medicinal diabetes education course, it's another also program was uh, developed by Qatar Diabetes Association, and it's still, still it's going on and very successful. Uh, in terms of the community service provided by diabetes education uh, unit, we are organizing usually different campaigns through the year, uh, addressing World Diabetes Day, diabetes occasions like Ramadan and Hajj. Also, we are addressing diabetes and importance of physical activity during the National Sport Day, vaccination campaign, school and diabetes. And this is some examples regarding to our uh, activity. Uh, uh, we, uh, we were able to reach to different areas in Qatar, like shopping area, schools, mosques, parks, uh, and beach as well. And this is some uh, live examples from this uh, awareness. But unfortunately, last year we were not able, but we use the self-management uh, SMS uh, programs, and we use our social media, and we use uh, videos education sent for <laughs> our patients. Uh, this is another example. We empower, uh, we train the Imam Mosque uh, to be uh, a peer support for uh, our patient. And this is example for the community uh, service. And also this another examples for our educational materials production from this uh, unit. Uh, also, we were able to develop until now uh, 15 educational videos. Uh, we have two important videos were translated during COVID crisis for six languages, uh, Tagalog and Niba, uh, Indian, Malayalam, uh, Urdu, to, uh, uh, to uh, help us in educating patients uh, during uh, quarantine, also Tamil. Uh, diabetes website available for public with different uh, pamphlets and information related. Also, uh, Diabetes email address for diabetes educator is also is available and provided for any patient would like to use this service. Thank you very much, and I'm ready. Uh, sorry, I uh, went quickly because I noticed the time is yeah. we are, uh, in short of time, limited. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manal, for your presentation and for your great effort that you are doing with the diabetic patients. So we can see that it's a very, very great effort, uh, especially with, like, uh, with the example you have provided, reducing H1C from 12 to 6. So this is actually a reflection of your great effort and contribution. So, um, yeah, thank you so good. much for uh, Dr. Diana, Dr. Ghadir and Dr. Manal for the rich and informative presentation. Uh, thank you so much, and I would like to thank the participants for their time to attend our CBD session. And just to remind you to claim your CBD points, I would appreciate if you fill in the CBD evaluation on our website. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's see. 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 Let's